and I am going to hand it over to our guest speakers who are Riley and Magda, and they are graduate students with the UNC Astronomy and Physics Department. So we're so glad that they wanted to share some of the fun things with us today. And so here I'm going to spotlight Riley and Riley's gonna take over and add his screen. And you will see Magda as well on the side. And here we go. <laughs> take it away, Riley. All right, hi, I'm Riley. Uh, I'm a second year graduate student here at UNC Chapel Hill uh, studying physics and astronomy. Hi, I'm Mugda Polimero, and I'm a fourth year graduate student uh, in, at UNC in the Physics and Astronomy Department. And we are going to talk today about astronomy in film, the way Hollywood gets it right and so wrong. So take it away, Riley. So a big motivation for this talk, obviously, is the stars, the cosmos, the universe, everything. Um, since humans have been around, uh, humans have always been fascinated by the stars and our place within it. Um, and the stars have been pretty useful to us humans. Uh, they're a good tool. Um, but aside from that, they also inspire lots of stories. And we see this across cultures. Um, ancient sailors use the stars for navigation purposes. We can track the motion of the sun using various structures like Stonehenge. And that tells us about when we should plant stuff, when we should harvest stuff. Um, but there are even stories that we tell about the stars. Um, the stars, uh, you know, in certain cultures, uh, the stars can be used, or at least thought of as like a way to understand where we come from and give us uh, insight into morals and, and wisdom, uh, such as the ancient Greeks. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of the constellations um, and, and how they thought the stars were placed in the heavens in permanence and by studying these constellations, we could learn more about um, how to be a good person and learn wisdom. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, in certain cultures, uh, studying the stars and, and learning these stories is a way to like sort of predict the future, sort of like astrology. Um, and so in the similar vein of storytelling and our fascination with the stars, um, the stars and storytelling have sort of remained a constant to today. And they make great fodder for science fiction movies. Um, there are countless movies that involve space that go on amazing adventures in space. And I love so many of them. I've seen so many, I love movies. And so what Mugda and I wanted to do was sort of dissect a little bit um, about uh, basically in these movies that are inspired by space and go to space and talk about space, how much is you know accurate, how much is real, true, and how much is not so true? How much is fiction? How much is stretching the truth? Um, while I would love to go through every single movie there ever was on space, um, unfortunately, we don't have the time to do that in this time window. Um, so we'll be focusing in, focusing in on three movies that sort of span a good chunk of the history of cinema. Um, so unfortunately, to the killer clowns of outer space fans, we won't be able to talk about the intricacies of that movie but maybe if you hit me up later, we can talk about that one. Um, so let's just jump right into it. We're gonna start with one of the earliest movies in film history. And that movie is A Trip to the Moon. A Trip to the Moon is a silent film. It's only about 12 minutes. It was made in 1902. This is one of the earliest movies ever made, period. And so it's no surprise that you know outer space has something to do with it because us humans are always fascinated by space. Um, this movie was influenced by Jules Verne's 1865 novel, From the Earth to the Moon, and it was widely popular for its time. This movie, while it was a French silent film, it got distributed nationwide. Um, and you've probably seen it, at least in pictures, if you've read The Invention of Hugo Cabret, uh, which was in part about this filmmaker, George Méliès. Um, so let's just run through the plot for people who maybe aren't familiar. Again, this is a really short film. You can find it on YouTube if you're interested. Um, but so the movie is about some astronomers back in the olden days. They look more like wizards than astronomers, if you can kind of see. It's not super great because this, remember, this is a very old movie. But the astronomers sort of look like wizards. Um, and you can tell they're fascinated by the moon. They've got their telescope focused in on the moon. They've got a diagram here that looks like it's the moon orbiting the Earth. And of course, you know, they've got their, tele their own personal telescopes here. Um, but uh, as we can tell right from the get-go, this movie isn't really trying to be all that realistic. It's pretty theatrical um, in its style. Um, 
and so what do the, the people fascinated by the moon want to do? They want to go to the moon. They want to visit it. And so they devise a plan with a spacecraft, which looks kind of like a module that we've seen that we've personally taken to the moon, but it looks kind of more like a bullet like that they're going to fire. And that's, you know, verified in their plan to actually get to the moon, which is to fire this bullet from a cannon um, at the moon. Not really, there's not really a return plan, it seems, in this method, but they're going to get there. Um, I think what's fun about this, this shot is that you can tell we're like on a mountain range, right? And so I guess the idea of the filmmakers is, you know, if we're really high up, it makes us closer to the moon. But I just want people to keep in mind the moon is on the on the like it's around 200,000 miles away and like mountain ranges are usually only like five miles high something like that so it's not going to help that much <laughs> um and uh, and of course they land on the moon this is probably the picture that most people are familiar with but you see the moon you know it's got its craters it also has a face which is very nice um but it looks like you know almost like the moons that we've seen just maybe a little smaller to scale, given that the bullet is this large. Um, and so then they explore the, the the lunar landscape. And now this is actually under the surface of the moon in the film. But what's interesting is, is that it seems that the moon is a pretty habitable place. Um, you've got waterfalls, you've got vegetation. Um, you can see there's a log here, so there's probably like trees, they got mushrooms. Um, but if you notice in the middle here, there's a little green man. Um, looks maybe like a cross between like a chicken and a lizard. But according to this movie, the, the moon does have life on it. Um, and our astronomer explorers um, in their very interesting spacesuit attire with a top hat, an umbrella, a green coat, um, they, uh, they encounter these aliens. They quickly discover that the aliens are hostile. They don't like people there, which is no surprise. They're sort of visiting a place that they weren't invited. Um, and the aliens, you know, capture them. Our astronomers are uh, on the run, on the surface. They eventually escape. They fall back down to Earth, and that's sort of where the movie ends. Um, you'll just notice here uh, in this close up, you know, we've got again the surface of the moon with the craters. So it's a little craggly. Um, and there, of course, is, I guess, the sun and the earth in the background. Um, but yeah, that's basically the gist of the movie. I just wanted to point out some key points of reference for this one, just to give us some more context about where this movie set in time. So again, reminder, this movie is made in 1902. Um, 1903 was actually when we flew for the first time. Uh, the Wright brothers achieved their first flight. Um, so this movie predates flight. And it's about going to the moon, which is arguably more impressive, more impressive a feat than simply flying on Earth. We're trying to fly out of Earth. Um, and then just to give us some more idea of like where astronomy is at, in 1902, this predates what we call the Great Debate in astronomy, which was when astronomers Harlow Shapley and uh, um, Heber Curtis debate the scale of the universe. Um, this was basically. At, in, in 1920, we still weren't sure about the actual scale of how things were. We weren't sure if the universe was just our Milky Way or if the Milky Way basically was its own galaxy and there were other galaxies outside it that would make up the greater universe. Um, and also we weren't sure if like we were at the center of our galaxy or elsewhere. It, three years later, 1923, Edwin Hubble is actually pictured down here in this crazy giant telescope, um, actually proved that we're not in our own, like we are not the only universe. In fact, we are just a galaxy and there are other galaxies outside it. And then of course, in 1969, we actually went to the moon, which is like 67 years after this movie was made. Um, so we've been there. So we know for the most part, this movie is just kind of crazy. Um, but it's fun to watch anyway. Um, we know from going to the moon, you know, the moon is not a hospitable place. Um, so like how, how our astronomers weren't wearing fancy spacesuits, um, we of course are. Um, but, you know, the movie did get some things right, like all the craters. Of course, we can see those with our telescopes, uh, and we could for many years. So we knew the moon was pretty cratery. Um, but obviously, you'd need special equipment to live there. Um, you know, the moon doesn't really have an atmosphere, doesn't really have too much gravity either. Um, and so the temperature changes on the moon are pretty extreme. Uh, during the day, um, you know, you might expect the temperatures to get up to in the realm of like 300 degrees Fahrenheit, 
and then at night it could drop down to negative 200 something like that degrees fahrenheit so pretty wild temperature changes i would not expect to see mushrooms on the moon sorry george milias um, but something that's not too far off is actually how they get to the moon surprisingly um you know they fire a bullet using some sort of combustion. Uh, it's not too different from a rocket ship. In fact, the shapes are even pretty similar. Just the difference is, is we're you know, controlling it a little better, but we're basically operating off of Newton's third law. We're shooting, ejecting a lot of mass down, which propels us up, similar in a way to how we blast a cannon. It's just slightly different, but still for a 1902 film, I'd say that's pretty impressive. Um, but so, while there's all this craziness in the movie, I think what's also fun to point out is that this movie is made in 1902 about some astronomers probably predating 1902 given their garb. Um, but even today, the core tools of astronomy have remained relatively the same. As you can see, they're using a telescope here to look at stuff in space. And that's essentially what astronomers do today. We look at stuff in space using fancy tools um, and we analyze data from looking essentially. Um, so here's me using a, a similar telescope to one that they use in the movie. Um, this one's a 12 inch reflecting telescope. So this one actually uses mirrors, but it operates the same way as one with lenses would. Essentially we're, we're zooming in, we're gathering light, it focuses it and we can look at it. Um, but of course we know today that it's not only optical light that we can see with telescopes, we can see the whole spectrum of light. And so uh, we use different types of telescopes to do that. Um, so this is a radio telescopes to observe radio waves, which are much bigger than optic wavelengths, hence why they're so big. This is the 30 meter uh, dish from the very large array in New Mexico. Um, and then this is the 100 meter uh, Green Bank telescope. This one's humongous. This one can actually fit two whole football fields in the dish itself. If you can see, here's me really tiny down here. Um, so, and, uh, but also there's some wavelengths of light that don't penetrate the atmosphere. And so we put telescopes in space to do that today. Um, so the Hubble Space Telescope observes in UV and optical. Um, and then, you know, that's floating out there. And NICER, which is a telescope that I used in undergrad, is uh, it's floating out in space on the International Space Station. And it observes in x-rays, which is like basically the same thing when you take a picture of your bones. But again, these are coming from objects in space, not generated in a machine. Um, but yeah. Thanks to all these fancy new innovations in telescopes, you can take very pretty pictures in space, like this one of the Hubble Deep Field. And of course, we know from pictures like these that there do exist galaxies very far, far away. Speaking of galaxies far, far away, that brings us to the next movie that we're going to talk about, Star Wars, one of my favorite film series. Um, Star Wars, I'm sure everybody knows what Star Wars is. Um, I don't think we need to go through the plot like in the previous one, but I'll just go through some, a little fun facts. Um, created in 1977, George Lucas, um, a testament to the popularity of stars and movies. Uh, Star Wars is um, the fifth highest grossing media franchise in history, and its estimated value is at 70 billion. So very popular, extremely popular. Um, but one of my favorite things about Star Wars is all the different crazy worlds that they get to visit and all the adventures they have on all these wildly different planets. Um, I study exoplanets. Um, and so I thought it'd be fun to look at sort of that in that vein, what, um, how Star Wars handles it. So, you know, in Star Wars, we get dense forests, uh, like on the moons of Endor. Um, there's also planets with very dense, thick, cloudy atmospheres, like on Bespin. Um, there's stormy ocean worlds uh, with uh, lots of water, no land in sight. Uh, imagine there's probably maybe aquatic life down here, who knows, uh, but that's, that's Kamino where they make the clones in Star Wars. Um, you know, there's, there's desolate ice worlds, which are probably very far away from their host star, very cold, um, like on Hoth. Um, and there's hot lava worlds, very inhospitable where finding the high ground is necessary for survival. Um, and, you know, there's also worlds that orbit multiple stars. And we actually see that in our own solar system, or not solar system, sorry, our own galaxy as well. Our own solar system only has one star, the sun. Um, but yeah, that brings us on this topic of exoplanets. So basically when we think of all these worlds that exist elsewhere, we're talking about 
planets that exist around other stars. And that's how we define what an exoplanet is. An exoplanet is just a planet that orbits a star that isn't the sun. Um, and to date, we've actually found around 4,000 exoplanets all within our own galaxy. We have yet to find a planet that exists outside of our galaxy in a galaxy far, far away, like in Star Wars, but we are looking. Um, and we, while we've only found 4,000 exoplanets, roughly, um, we expect that it's possible that there are actually on the order of billions of exoplanets that exist in our Milky Way alone. Um, but there could be billions. That's if we assume that like there's maybe a one planet orbiting every star. But exoplanets are really, really, really hard to find. So that's why we've only really found 4,000 yet. We're just now scratching the surface. So how do we find them? Um, planets don't shine like stars do. So we have to use a few indirect methods to find them. Uh, basically, looking at the brightness of stars and how it changes with time. The most popular detection is what we call the transit method, and that's sort of depicted in this figure here. So when we look at a star and a planet ha is orbiting it, when the planet, planet passes in front of that star, it'll block some of that starlight which we're seeing here as we plot brightness versus time on this plot. And it makes its way across, and eventually it passes away from in front of the star. And so we'll see the signature dip when we were looking at stars, and that will tell us, oh, maybe there's a planet there. It's not always a planet. Sometimes it might be a binary star system where the, the secondary star is very dim, very small in comparison to the host. Um, but that's essentially what we're doing, is we're looking at brightness, and trying to see if it changes periodically. We have managed to image, like look at planet systems and image them, but that's very rare and few and in between. This is a example though. Again, I, I told you stars are very bright, planets are not. So these stars are going to outshine the planets. So we have to actually think of ways to mask them. So we mask out the star's brightness and then you can see the planets orbiting. But this is basically the most detailed picture we have of planets that exist elsewhere. They're very far away. They're very small. They don't shine. So it's very, very, very difficult to actually take a picture of them. So we don't really have an idea of what they look like, what their properties are, other than what we can infer from our indirect de detection methods. But even still, the exoplanet population that we have found, the 4,000 or so that we found, uh, is very diverse. Um, now, recall I just said we can't really see them. So we have to infer these properties. Um, so you're probably like, do these, Riley, how do we know that these look like that? Well, we don't. This is, these are all artist representations of these planets, but we can infer properties from our indirect detection methods. From looking at the, the dip in light, you can infer the size of the planet. And then looking at gravitational interactions, you can infer the mass of the planet. And so with size and with mass, you can then infer the density and from the density, you can say, oh, this is density maybe similar to Earth, so it might be rocky. Um, so that's how we like get planets that are maybe like super Earths, which are like similar density to Earth, but maybe bigger. Or, you know, we might get planets that are about the same size as Jupiter, and based on their density, we might say, oh, yeah, they're pretty similar to Jupiter, they're pretty gassy. Um, you know, but we've also found, you know, planets that are humongous. Uh, we've also we've found planets that are really old, really young. We've even found planets that exist in multiple star systems, sort of like the one like on Tatooine. Um, so here's a planet here that's orbiting in a triple star system, actually. This one was found not too long ago with TESS. Um, yeah. But so the diversity of the, the planets in Star Wars checks out, but something that sort of bothers me is that they never wear spacesuits in Star Wars. They're traveling to all these different planets all over the place. They never wear spacesuits. They're not wearing breathing apparatus. They're, they're wearing robes and not much else. Um, so what's the deal? Basically, this tells us that every planet they visit in Star Wars is effectively habitable. Well, how do we know if a planet's habitable? Well, does it exist in the habitable zone? That's essentially what we're looking at as astronomers today. And again, the habitable zone is mainly just a theory. Um, it's basically defined as like, if a planet is far away from its host star, such that it's the conditions are right, such that there's liquid water and the atmosphere is like conducive to human life. And so that's what this green bar is really showing is that these 
planets here are planets that we would expect to be in the habitable zone. They've got liquid water. They could, they could sustain life like us as we know it. Of course, there could be life that lives in a completely different way on different systems. Uh, but you know, as you move closer, things get really hot. You sort of lose that liquid water, and your atmosphere sort of change. This is like a zinc sulf sulfur. Uh, I don't know chemistry, unfortunately, very well. But zinc sulfide, maybe atmosphere, and then like a uh, you know CO two atmosphere back here. But these are really cold. These are really hot. Not really conducive. We really want that Goldilocks zone, right in between. So Earth is kind of special in that way. Um, and we have found habitable worlds uh, in our in our. Uh, um, Galaxy, uh, habitable. Again, this is speculation, but this is a very popular one, the TRAPPIST-1 system, uh, where we found seven Earth-like planets all orbiting very, very, very closely to this dwarf star. But because it's a dwarf star um, and they're very close, it's possible that they have liquid water on them. Um, see, to give you a size comparison, this is the size of the star in that solar system, and here's Jupiter. They're about the same size, and you'll notice the planets here are all about the same size as Earth. Um, but that's just, you know, we have found planets where it's possible there could be habitability on them. We just haven't really been able to test them. And that's, of course, because ha the habitable zone is really just a theory, and it's not really that simple. There are so many factors that we have to include when we're talking about whether a place is habitable besides just how far away it is from its sun and if it is cold, like a proper temperature to host the things that we as humans need. And you know, so that includes, you know, obviously planetary properties like the atmosphere, interior, surface, orbital, orbital dynamics, but also, of course, effects from the star and how it interacts with things in its own solar system. Um, so, getting to this wider question of like the planets in Star Wars are all habitable, is that really feasible? Is that possible? I mean, sure, it's possible that there could exist that many habitable worlds that the people in Star Wars could go to. Of course, though, there is a catch. Um, in Star Wars, when they visit all these different planets, they're, they get there in the blink of an eye. And that's because all their spaceships can travel at the speed of light. Um, but at least in our own galaxy, I don't think we would be able to visit all these planets very readily um, because, for one, traveling at the speed of light is not yet possible. And I don't think will ever be possible because sort of when you get to that speed, the laws of physics sort of break down. Um, but also, our nearest neighbor in our own galaxy is uh, Alpha Centauri, and that's uh, that's about four light years away. So even if we could travel the speed of light, it would take us four years to to reach the nearest planet, which is not really the blink of an eye, unfortunately. So that's a little bit of movie magic going on, a little bit of stretching the truth. Um, Unless, of course, in that galaxy, all the planets just happen to be really close together, which I don't think is the case. Um, but uh, so, yeah. Um, but uh, potentially, this could be happened if we could find a way to sort of warp space time rather than going the speed of light. Um, but again, that's another theory. Um, speaking of warping space time, though, um, now I think I'm going to hand it off to Mugda, and she's going to tell you about our next movie. Uh, Interstellar. All right, so let us talk about Interstellar. So this movie came out in uh, 2014, and uh, I think it's a really special movie. It is uh, my favorite movie of all time for uh, many, many reasons. And, uh, and it was very exciting for it, uh, the film community because it was just a really good movie but it was also very exciting for the space community because uh, it is probably the most scientifically accurate space movies of all time. So there's an actual Nobel laureate, Kip Thorne, who is the consultant for all the science stuff in the movies. So Christopher Nolan, uh, the director of all the Batman movies, um, actually consulted, wrote the script with Kip Thorne. He was an executive producer on the on the movie. So there was a lot of thought put into uh, all the science that goes on in the in the movie. So uh, that was super exciting for anybody who is a space nerd. Uh, movie grossed about $700 million, so definitely very, very popular. 
And uh, I just want to point out that it has some of the most complex VFX and CGI ever done in the history of movies. Uh, the whole movie required about 800 terabytes of data. That is way more than any real astronomer would go through in, in, a, in a lifetime. Um, and the reason for this is because they had like really lots of high definition simulations. So like any any uh, theoretical simulation you might have seen of like uh, planets or uh, black holes or all those things, but all of that was made in like whatever, like, you know, Dolby Vision IMAX quality. So yes, very, very data intensive. Um, and fun fact, so like all the math that you see on the boards over here was actually written by Kip Thorne, who studies uh, general relativity and black holes and simulates all the fun stuff in space. So this is not like the A plus B whole square kind of fake math that you see in movies. This was actually real general relativity tensor math, which is so cool. Uh, movies rarely represent science so accurately. So I just love this movie, as you can tell. Uh, all right. So here's like a quick overview of the plot. Uh, if you haven't watched this movie yet, I apologize for the spoilers, uh, but please go watch it as soon as this call is over. Uh, so it's set in like a dystopian near future where the earth is dying because of climate change like issues. And there is a secret NASA mission that is trying to recruit these four uh, astronauts and put them on this spaceship that is going to travel to some candidate habitable planets to see if they can like create a new earth essentially. So now the key here is candidate habitable planet because um, as, as Riley was saying earlier, that the definition of the habitable zone or finding a plant in the habitable zone is uh, very, very broad. It literally for all practical purposes only means that you need to be able to somehow have liquid water on that planet. Now that is such a broad definition uh, that it doesn't necessarily mean that if you have a habitable planet that you and I can just you know pack our bags and go and transplant there. That's probably not going to happen, not what's going to happen. And that's the whole plot of the movie. So that was very, very grounded in reality that astronomers did their research. They found these candidate planets and they're sending astronauts to check it out. Now, the sending astronauts to check it, part, check it out part is obviously fiction because we can't do that yet. But, uh, but the motivation is very scientifically driven. So how do they get there? So they space travel via wormholes. So this is where... Um, where you kind of fix that problem that Star Wars had, uh, because as Riley said, we cannot travel at the speed of light yet. And even if we did, we don't necessarily know that humans would survive it because like physics kind of gets wonky at that point. So we're not really sure if our dainty little bodies could take it. Uh, so now what is a wormhole? Okay, let's just unpack that first. So basically a wormhole in so many words is a shortcut through space, okay? So if I want to go here from point A to point B, instead of walking all the way around this like you know path, I just have a tunnel that is a shortcut. So it's much like if you wanted to cross a mountain, you would, instead of walking up and then walking down, you would just bore a tunnel straight through it and uh, cross it. And this is so much more important because distances in space are just, everything in space is just very, very far apart. So, uh, saving time is very important. So now what is uh, pictured in the movie is this bubble, uh, which doesn't look anything like any wormhole ever uh, shown on TV. And uh, that is because uh, it is, it's actually very grounded in, uh, in, in physics because, so if you have your TV, your computer screen and you wanted to go through it, you would walk through a circle. And that's because your TV screen is two dimensional, but space is three dimensional. So what is a circle in three dimensions? A sphere, ta-da, and that's what they have. So uh, yeah, so this was like very, uh, very well explained, very well represented in the movie. However, wormholes, uh, as we know today, do not exist. It is a theoretical construct. We uh, we think that they cannot form naturally, so uh, we have never 
found it and uh, we're not sure if we haven't found it because they don't exist or because we simply cannot see them if they do exist. But so that was the part where the movie was like, you know, stretching the truth to the uh, to the absolute max uh, because we, we, we don't have any indication that wormholes exist. Um, okay. And now let's talk about the planets a little bit. So the planets are named after the astronauts who first went there. So this is man's planet, or as I like to call it, Matt Damon's planet. Uh, and uh, it's an ice world with early 80% Earth's gravity. Both of these are grounded in reality, as uh, Riley was saying. It had an ammonia-filled atmosphere and liquid water and clouds. So liquid water, habitable zone, it checks out. But if there is an atmosphere filled with ammonia, your water is also ammonia filled and your atmosphere is ammonia filled, which is exactly why Matthew McConaughey is still in his space suit because otherwise he would probably be poisoned and die, uh, which is which is not fun. So, uh, so yeah, so this planet uh, probably was uh, based off of something that's very realistic. And uh, another fun fact is that Saturn's moon, Enceladus, not even a planet, is NASA's best bet for life outside of Earth. And why? Because Enceladus has like this water uh, geyser system going on under its surface, we think. Uh, we don't know because we haven't really gone there. But uh, it seems to have like water geysers under the surface and also has ammonia. And uh, it, it just sounds like Earth a few, you know, a uh, million years ago when life was just starting to form. So that's amazing. So not even planets, even moons can have such cool stuff. So the next one is Miller's planet. Uh, this one's a water world with 130% of Earth's gravity. So uh, it would, you would weigh 30% more uh, than you would on Earth. And uh, walking would be very difficult because, you know, it would be like you had ankle weights. Um, and uh, but a water world, definitely possible. 130% Earth's gravity, definitely possible. Uh, close to the black hole Gargantua, and we will unpack that black hole in just a bit. But um, so now this is definitely possible. Uh, we have not found a planet around a black hole yet, but it is possible. And, and Kip Thorne actually uh, took a lot of effort to make sure that they represented that well, because um, uh, contrary to popular belief, nothing, not everything around a black hole just automatically disappears into the black hole because then otherwise nothing would ever exist. Uh, but uh, if a black hole is spinning really, really fast, like Gargantua was, it was spinning at like 99.9999 something percent uh, the speed of light, then you can have a couple of stable orbits around the black hole. The same way the Earth and uh, Mars have stable orbits around the sun, you could have stable orbits um, around the black hole. So that's that's how they uh, they justify that there is a planet around this black hole. And because you have this, this supermassive black hole that has such a strong gravitational pull, you have massive tidal waves. Now, tidal waves are uh, pretty much the same thing like how um, the moon's gravity or the presence of the moon, whether it's closer or further away from us, uh, affects like waves, so you get high tide and low tide. That's exactly the same uh, phenomena that's going on on this Miller planet. Uh, but because it's a black hole, that gravitational effect of high tide is way, way, way more pronounced. So here's a little infographic. Uh, the tallest wave on Earth is about 100 feet. So like for an average six foot human, that's still six times as tall. Uh, then there's the Empire State Building at 1,400 feet. And then there's that wave interstellar that they thought was a mountain, was 4,000 feet. We are yet to build something that tall vertically. Uh, but as you can imagine, having 4,000 feet waves coming crashing down on you is not very conducive to human life because our bodies would break. So uh, both these planets had liquid water, which is why they were in the habitable zone, but were not technically habitable uh, by humans, at least. So uh, that was the planet. So now Gargantua, this was, is a still taken from the movie. It is the most accurate representation of a supermassive black hole ever in film. 
And this is so, so, so exciting, uh, uh, especially as an astronomer. I study black holes as part of my uh, as part of my PhD thesis. And this is uh, this is akin to the best simulations we have of black holes. So to see that in a film is was absolutely amazing. And I wanted to say that this film was released in 2014. Uh, the first image we have ever seen of a black hole was in 2019. So five years before the fact that we have even seen a black hole, it had the most accurate representation, which is part of what makes this movie so, so amazing. Uh, and okay, so now again, let's unpack what is a black hole. So unlike its name suggests, it's not a hole. It's actually quite the opposite of that. Uh, it's an object that has a very, very high mass that is kind of like uh, squeezed into a very, very small volume. So like basically if you had a rubber sheet like this, if you think of the universe as like a giant rubber sheet, uh, and if you had any heavy thing, like a, like a shot but metal ball, it would uh, it would sink that rubber sheet, would make a little dent in it. Uh, now, if you kept compressing that mass into a very, 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 very small volume, and then you drop that ball on the rubber sheet of space and time, it makes uh, that, that dent uh, or the distortion in that rubber sheet very, very pronounced. So basically what happens is that because Black holes are so small and, and but still uh, have such a high mass. They have a very high density, and that's what kind of uh, makes them have a very deep. It's literally called a well, a potential well, because you like a well that you fall into, and uh, and and this potential well is the reason that a black hole uh, has such a strong gravitational pull that if you go close enough to it, like if you go beyond the event horizon nothing, not even light can escape it. So that's that's essentially uh, what's going on in a black hole. So um, so this is like a, a real uh, NASA simulation of, of, of a black hole. And this is kind of what you saw in the interstellar uh, picture. So now what is going on here? Like, uh, so this orange glowing thing is actually just a disc, a glowing hot disc of, uh, gas and dust in space. Now, uh, everyone's like, but wait, things are supposed to fall into the black hole. Why Why does it have rings? This is weird. But uh, just think about it for a second. Like if you, for example, filled a tub with water and then you pulled the plug, all the water doesn't just immediately disappear, right? So it takes some time, it swirls around the drain and then slowly goes down. So that's exactly what happens to, uh, to gas and dust in space, essentially, when they get close enough, they start swirling around the black hole at very, very high speeds. And that's the reason it starts glowing because it becomes very hot as it's moving. So it essentially is like, a, you know, a, a glowing piece of coal in uh, around the black hole. And so then you're like, okay, so that must look like a ring of dust around, uh, around the black hole, kind of like what Saturn looks like, except, you know, uh, black hole in the center and glowing hot dust around it. Then what is this weird thing up and down, right? Like that's just weird. So the black hole doesn't have two rings, it just has one. However, the, the gravitational uh, pull of the black hole is so high that it essentially bends light. So what you're seeing on top here is basically the image of the disk that's behind the black hole. So it's almost like someone like took a lens, like the ones you, you, know, you wear in your glasses, but a very, very strong lens to a point that you could see what's behind the black hole. So it's like the image is kind of like showing up behind the black hole. And in the same way on the bottom, it's basically the image of the underside of that uh, accretion disk, which is a disk of dust and gas around it. So uh, this complex structure actually uh, is not so complex when you break it down. Um, and so now to the real picture of the black hole. So this is the image that we got, nothing as, uh, stunning as what we see it in Interstellar, but it is amazing if you consider that uh, taking this picture in the galaxy uh, that we took it on is the equivalent of being able to zoom in and see an orange on the moon, which is ridiculous. Uh, so this is how the, uh, uh, the, the astronomers simulated it, and then they kind of blurred the simulation to what they thought that the, uh, the resolution of the telescope was. And this is what they actually saw pretty, pretty close to reality. 
So now you may be thinking, well, this doesn't look anything like interstellar. So why are you so hyped up about it, Mugda? You're a real astronomer. I will tell you that I am because uh, the way the black hole appears to us depends on the orientation that we're looking at it. So the one in interstellar, they were looking at pretty edge on, like the way we see Saturn. So you see the rings cutting through the planet. But then imagine if you uh, were in a spacecraft and you went above Saturn and looked at it, then all you would see is, uh, is the rings from atop. So it would just literally look like a ring. And that's exactly what we're seeing. So, uh, so yes, it is, it is the same uh, uh, essential representation. The physics is all there. It's just that they, uh, interstellar could choose how to look at the black hole. We couldn't because, you know, we see what is there in nature and what, what is there in nature is this, and we got that. So it is very, very grounded in reality. Okay, so now is where I start having issues with the movie uh, because then they actually go inside the black hole and in the movie, uh, inside the black hole leads him to this tesseract, which goes behind his, uh, him being Matthew McConaughey, uh, his kid's bookshelf. And then there's this whole story uh, behind that. Uh, and so this is definitely uh, not true. Um, we'll talk about what's inside a black hole, but I can tell you it's not it's not the backside of a bookcase. I can I can I can show you that that's not true. Uh, in reality, though, if you went close enough to the black hole, you would literally turn into spaghetti and then space dust. So, um, and this is the famous spaghettification. And uh, why this happens is actually, if you think back to that, like that well that we saw, the gravitational well. So th like the difference in gravity between every point uh, near the black hole is so, uh, is so different, right? So every part of your body is attracted to that black hole with different forces. So now what that means is that your body, uh, all, all the atoms in your body are literally uh, being pulled at different forces. So you will become space noodles and then space dust and then one with the cosmos. I mean, if that is a goal, uh, then that's that's totally fine. But if if you, like me, don't want to be turned into space noodles, don't go near a black hole. Very simple. Um, all right. So what is really inside a black hole? So now, spoiler alert, like no one knows. Uh, we have so many theories. Uh, so this one uh, is kind of a representation of this wormhole thing we were looking at. Like some people think that a black hole could lead into a wormhole and then, you know, you can come out the other side of its doppelganger white hole. Uh, we, that's just a theory. None of that really exists right now. Or it could just be like this void that Squidward is just falling into for all of eternity. I mean, like, who knows? Um, but then you're like, okay, but what is really inside the black hole? So my answer is possibly nothing and everything. And the reason I say that is because uh, uh, I say nothing because uh, all the laws of physics as we know it beyond the event horizon break. So if you somehow managed to uh, stay intact, not spaghettify and go cross that event horizon, you would probably see nothing, but there is everything there, right? Because there's so much mass concentrated beyond that point that it it's almost, it's like a hundred million suns in the size of like a basketball, you know? So it's just like, it's like so much mass. It's, it, it should feel like almost everything in the world is there and yet there's nothing because you can't see anything. Um, what would, happen if you could cross that threshold uh, and keep your mind and body uh, together is that you probably would just be falling like forever. Uh, and that's our best guess uh, of what would happen. But if someone does go inside a black hole, please come back and let me know what happens because I am very curious. So overall, Interstellar was a movie that was very much grounded in, in reality. Uh, it is like I said, still the best representation of, of uh, astronomical fact that we have in, in Hollywood. Um, but of course, uh, as, as one should, everyone has artistic license when you're making a movie. And, uh, and, and the wormholes and the black hole and the, what's inside the black hole was definitely artistic license. But uh, overall, highly recommend. So 
that's all from me. Do we have any questions? Thank you, Magda. That was great. <laughs> Valerie says, Magda is the best. I love listening to her talk and describe this. Thank you, Valerie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, let me see. I'm going to bring uh, Riley back to here. Riley will spotlight you as well. OK. All right, so um, everyone in our audience, if you have any questions that you would like to add, go ahead and type them in now. And we do have a few that we saved earlier. Um, let's see. So from G, which also is Ann Murphy next to G, can we infer the atmospheres by the spectra? And then did they explain where the light comes from on the planet in interstellar? And does the light come from the glowing disk? That's a lot of um, questions, sorry. And, and whichever one you want to answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I can take the, the one on the atmospheres. Um, yeah, so there is work being done to analyze the spectra of uh, explained atmospheres. I think the most common way that we would do that is something known as transit spectroscopy. Essentially, when the planet passes in front, um, light from the star will go through the atmosphere and get blocked by that atmosphere. And um, basically when the light interacts with different atoms, molecules in the atmosphere, um, it can get blocked. And so we can infer what might be in those atmospheres based on how the light interacts with the atmosphere itself when it, before it gets to us. Um, and again, for people who may not be super familiar, the spectrum is basically when we look at the, we basically make a rainbow of the light and inspect it and how it's unique uh, because the spectrum basically certain atoms block specific wavelengths of light. And so when we see, when we look at those specific wavelengths, we can infer things about the chemical composition. Uh, but basically, yes, we can study atmospheres. We're trying to, yeah. Cool, thank you. And then um, Renee has asked, is Gargantua a real black hole or is it just made up? Um, as it is definitely based on a real black hole. So there are black holes that exist that have the mass of uh, 100 million um, uh, suns. Uh, but um, as far as I know, it is it is definitely fictional. Uh, but everything about his representation was accurate. Um, and uh, I just wanted to mention that, that that glowing hot disk is the only reason that, uh, or well, one of the few reasons that we know that the black hole even exists, and that is exactly what I do for my research. That's how I find black holes, by looking for that glowing hot disk. Uh, there was a question saying, where does the light come from on the, this planet? I assume the planet around the black hole. Um, and you're right, the, the light does come from, uh, from the glowing disk. Um, and uh, basically, the black hole to that planet is what the sun is to us. And, uh, and, you know, I, if you were close enough, uh, the, the, the light and, and, the, and the heat from that, from that particular uh, accretion disk would be enough to actually have a planet uh, around it. Um, I think the only misrepresentation is that, I'm pretty sure this is true, but if you, are, if you needed to be that close, you would actually see the black hole in the sky of that, of that uh, of that planet, um, and I don't think that that is very clear in the movie. I was um, sharing a link, Magda, from the Instagram that you had shared earlier. So, yes. Um, it looks like we have another question. Was the time distortion on the water planet in Interstellar accurate? Um, yes, yes, that was actually, uh, very accurate. So um, yeah, there there was, uh, I think all, all the math, everything checks out for whatever, whatever distance that they were at, everything checks out. Okay, cool. And then um, we're getting a lot of compliments to the both of you. So everyone has really enjoyed your presentation, myself included. Thank you so much. <laughs> and um, let me see, I'm gonna share my screen one more time too, so that, um, and we can continue to talk for a few more minutes if anyone else has anything that they would like to ask. So thank you so much again, everybody, for joining us on this Saturday morning at 11 and for participating in Astronomy Days. Adam's included a link. You can um, check out some more information and order space gear from this virtual Astronomy Days at this website link here. Um, museum members save 10%. So 
please join us today to learn more about that and how you can support the museum and science. And thank you again to our sponsor, Space Grant, North Carolina Space Grant. Thank you again to Magda and Riley for joining us and sharing their excitement and expertise about astronomy and space movies. It's really fun, you know, um, we all look to movies and TV for entertainment, but it's, it's fun to look at it through the lens of, well, is this real or not? How real is this? It's really fun to think about that when you're watching entertaining things. Everybody, let's see. Everyone is saying thank you. They had a lot of fun. Great job. Best of luck in your research. Thank you, Tina. <laughs> thank you everyone for coming. This was so much fun. And thank, thank you Astronomy Days for having us. This was, this was absolutely amazing. Yes, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Sorry, Riley. Oh, I was just saying thank you. Um, if everyone, if anyone has any specific questions about the killer clowns of outer space, feel free to message me. I'm happy <laughs> to talk about it. <laughs> That's really great. <laughs> Next time. That's we can we you know um you can do that at another we we there's so many space movies, right? We're gonna have you all be like an annual participant to present these things to everyone. <laughs> so Thanks yes, again, we, everybody. <laughs> we will be happy to make a weekly event of this. Uh, every week, <laughs> let's talk about a movie. Let's do it. <laughs> have a great rest of your day, everyone. Um, today, we have a few more programs for Astronomy Days, and then tomorrow is our last day. So we hope to see you again tomorrow. Um, thanks again, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye.